We are called to surrender grievances against fellow believers visibly to the world because, oh, and I apologize. I was so distracted not going through the scriptures for you this morning. We are called to surrender grievances against fellow believers visibly to the world because of our authority as saints. We surrender those grievances to the world invisibly. We give up our problems and our grievances because of our authority that you have as saints. For those of you who may not remember, I haven't referred to you in that, and I used to say it often, is that you, good morning, dear sweet saints. You are sweet saints. It says it in the New Testament. It says it in the Old Testament. You're not granted sainthood by an individual or the church. It is given to you. You are imbued with it because of Christ and what he has done on the cross as he has redeemed you to be the saints of God. But because of that authority, we should surrender our problems, our grievances, the issues that we have with people. That's Better said than easier said than done, right? It's kind of hard to let go of some things whenever I'm wronged and someone hurts me. Paul is blunt and to the point in that we do not bring the righteous before the unrighteous, the saintly before the unsaintly, the redeemed before the unredeemed. The world has no business in our affairs. You understand? The world has no business in our affairs. Now, let me say this. We do know that, and everybody, we're thinking, well, we, we have the law that we can deal with things. And again, every Sunday I write a little question to the ladies over in their Bible study classroom, and I ask them, do Christians have the right to go to take people to court to handle those issues? Anyone? Well, as it says here, and you'll go through the rest of this text together, you'll understand that Christians don't take Christians to court. We don't go to the law with one another, no matter what the issue is. We'll get through this some more here in a minute. But you may be thinking, well, hold on. I remember reading in the Old Testament that the first judge was who? Since y'all like trivia so much on Sunday nights. Or was it Sunday night or Wednesday night? It was Wednesday night. Do y'all, who was the first judge? Moses. They were to bring all their law issues to Moses. Now hold on. You just said we're not supposed to bring people before the law, before the courts. He was a judge. He was in fact the judge. The difference is he was a godly man. He served two roles. As the judge and as the pastor. Whenever I first got here, I actually told Jeff, I was like, if people come up and say they have an issue, tell them that they need to first go and talk to the individual and deal with it. That is true. Insofar as you're going through the Matthew 18 protocols of dealing with problems. But then, if there's an actual issue between the two of you, or individuals of any law of nature, it's supposed to be dealt with within the church, within God's people. It doesn't get to be taken out into the public. It invites them into church issues. And the state's already doing well enough on their own trying to get involved in church issues. We don't need to give them a leg up. But the difference was is that Moses was a pastor and dealt with these issues amongst God's people. And that's it. They didn't go to the, the out, outside tribes and deal with these issues. And then you say, well, there were other judges throughout time. And even Jesus was appeared before the judges, the courts, the Sanhedrin, the 70. Yes, he did do that. Were they godly men? No. They were lawyers. Though they observed God and used God's law, it's no different than the Supreme Court or other courts in our land today that will say that it is unlawful to steal. Does that sound familiar? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't have adultery. That's a Ten Commandment. Don't lie. Don't murder. Those are God's commandments. So does that mean the Sabine County Courthouse, there, that is a godly place to be and to where you go and take care of your business? No. I'm not saying that there are not, un, there are not godly people there. That's not what I'm saying. But that's now the law that is detached from God's 
work. So we are to go to those who are involved in God's work and deal with those issues. Am I a lawyer? No, but I believe that through Scripture, through prayer, and through walking through Scripture and what God has commanded us to do, we can deal with issues in the church. We can handle the things of this world. If there's a property disagreement or something, we can as Christians handle and deal with that. I have an encroachment on my property with my neighbor. We talked a couple weeks back, and it's like, what do we need to do about this? It's like, I don't care about it. It's not a big deal. It's a little sliver of concrete that has been pushed onto my side of the property. I don't care. It's not a big deal. It's not something to get upset about. I don't need to be bothered by it. And if we were Christians and there was an issue about it, I guarantee you we can go before the church or to other Christians and deal with it. All that. But now that we have the point that we do not go to court with one another, you can remember what had happened in chapter 5, verse 12. And actually he said, for, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So there, there's the relation between the two chapters. Verse 13 starts off with God judges those who are outside. That's their deal. God deals with the world. We deal with one another. As Christians, we are to handle our own affairs. But we have no business bringing our affairs before, the church, before anyone else outside of the church. Daniel chapter 7 verse 22 actually speaks of the fact that we were... Uh, we are in the ancient of days when we come and judgment has given... For the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. See, this, this idea of judging the world is talking about our future, where we're going to be after this world is gone. We're going to stand in possession of the kingdom, and we are going to judge the world. Now, what that looks like, nobody really knows and nobody really fully understands. But you see how the Old Testament affirms it. So does the New Testament. Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, when he's talking to the disciples, said, You twelve will sit on thrones that I have set up for you to judge the twelve tribes. They have a job to do. That they will judge God's people. God's chosen people will be put on trial. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it says this, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. You see, he's talking about future situations of what's going to happen and where and what authority we have. So if we have that authority in the future sense, though we're not doing it now, why can't we handle issues amongst ourselves? This is not an accusation of anything specific of the church. I've told you that this past week. But things have happened in the past. Things will happen in the future. Things are possibly happening right now where we have a discrepancy or an issue with somebody in the church. Maybe not so far as it is to deal with the law, but we still should deal with the issues willingly as God's people. You know, I would look at this and not, not think it's so far off that Paul uses the word incompetent to actually mean dumb. Because I'll be honest, I'll be the first one to say it. Your pastor's not very bright. Good, no laughter, thank you. But I'm not. I do and say dumb things. You want a witness, my wife can testify that I am not the brightest. I say dumb things and then come back and be like, ah, that was a mistake. I lashed out. I said this. Shouldn't have said that. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. I'm human and I'm male. Oh, you laugh at that. <laughs> but this word is not meaning dumb. This word does not mean dumb. And it is, it is actually anexios, meaning you don't meet the requirements to do so. Or as a visual, you're out of balance. Kind of like scales. Kind of like justice. You see Lady Justice? Kind of similar to that. But that's what he's referencing here. Is, are, 
you are so out of balance with who you actually are. You don't recognize your authority and who you are in God and through Christ that you can't even deal with these issues. You have to go to pagans. You have to go to people that have absolutely no idea about God's kingdom and God's people and expect them to deal with this correctly? No. Paul is literally saying here that you are so out of balance with your status that God gave them that they can't even settle the simplest of situations this side of glory. It's sad when people, by their actions, ignore God's given ability and authority. Well, hold on, Brother J.R., it actually isn't saying anything. Well, we should give up our grievances and our problems with one another. It's not saying that anywhere here. Yeah, it is, but it's all inclusive. We have to break it down into small chunks for you. But you're. But whenever you see all this text, you'll understand. So let's go to verse 5 through 7 right here. Oh, actually, is this my first part? Oh, yeah, this is. Maybe. I don't like this thing. Miss Mim, can you press the, the right arrow on that computer, please? Batteries must have died again. I promise I changed. We changed these like two weeks ago. Is it not doing it? Tap the, on the screen. You'll see those little arrows. Tap the one on the right. Charles O'Neill is suing uh, a family in Oregon after they decided to write bad reviews about his church online. Now we have a video on this. Let's watch the local news report and we'll discuss. When Julie Ann Smith got frustrated, she got online. I thought, I'm just going to post a review. We do it with restaurants and hotels and whatnot. And I thought, why not do it with this church? Never did she think Beaverton Grace Bible Church and Pastor Charles O'Neill would slap her with a $500,000 lawsuit. When the Smiths left the church, Julianne says friends were told to end all contact. But if I went to Costco or you know any place in town, if I ran into somebody, they would turn their turn their heads and walk the other way. All that we did was ask questions. We just raised concerns. There's no sin in that. Dissatisfied, she went online to write reviews. Reviews other church members tried to counteract with church praise. So Julianne started this blog, but her words, creepy, cult, control tactics, and spiritual abuse, the pastor claims in this lawsuit are defamation. You know, what somebody does in their church is one thing, but when you get out into society, we, we have the right to free speech. And it may not be what people want to hear, but we absolutely have that right. The lawsuit didn't stop with Julianne, her daughter, and three other commenters sued too. He can say what he wants in a church and say don't talk about this or don't talk about that or don't talk to this person but when you when you're out in the civil world you don't do that anymore and he's not my pastor anymore and he does not have that right to keep people from talking. (sighs) 
couple of things happen there. Oh, one back one. Yeah. Back up one. There we go. Number one, who cares if somebody posts something online about the church? Well, we have to maintain our witness, but we don't need to get in a fight online, an argument. Number two, that pastor is completely wrong. 100% wrong for filing a lawsuit against another believer. Whether that person was wrong or not, if she's a believer, they should have just dealt with it or, or dealt with it verbally in a conversation, but then let it go. It should have never been public to, about anything. Nothing should have happened, especially a lawsuit. For somebody giving a review on Yelp, a couple of things other than that happened. One, it was the lawsuit going to court, going to the world to deal with an issue. Two, the woman did take the church to court. Court has changed over these years. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need a courtroom, somebody with a robe. You don't need anybody with a gavel. All you need to do is go online and make a post on Facebook, on some other platform. Because now everybody else hears and you've gone and taken them to a court of your peers where they pass down judgment and say, oh yeah, we agree, this place is terrible. And, and it just gets flooded. People do that all the time nowadays. Facebook has become the courtroom. I have a problem. I'm going to share that with the world. And then they are going to summarily pass judgment. Am I wrong? Have you not scrolled through Facebook and looked and seen what people have said? I have people in my own family that will post things. And then everybody else just floods. Oh, you are so right. They are so this and this and this. We don't need a courtroom anymore. We have Facebook. We have other platforms. But let's go on with this. Look at verse uh, 5 through 7. I say this to your shame. Is it working? I miss Jeff. <laughs> Try tapping. There we go. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? We are called to surrender grievances against fellow believers visibly to the world for the sake of our witness. For the sake of who we are as a church. And not just you specifically, but for the entire church body. Not just Fairdale Baptist Church, but First Baptist Hemp Hill. The big churches across America that are actually doing God's will. For the church as a whole, God's people. When we do something goofy, like file a $500,000 lawsuit against multiple family members and friends who ever made statements, and I'm not saying we're doing that. We are damaging the church as a whole, not the individual church. It's harmful to everybody. My witness is put in jeopardy because individuals can't deal with a problem themselves. We teach our kids. He hit me, he hit me, he hurt me. Did you tell him not to? Go away from him. Get away. No, they want to go to the law, which is mom and dad. Teach them to deal with an issue. If Christians can't go and deal with issues with one another, it's no different than them being children, go running to mom and dad saying, he hurt me. They're not a part of the situation. They are, and they can, and they should deal with it. 
But in, Matthew, in Acts chapter 18, verse 12, Paul was brought, brought to the local magistrate. And here's the cool thing. We actually have evidence that Gaius was at, Gallio was actually the proconsul at the time that Paul was brought before him in Corinth, a little bit before this letter. And he actually told them, whenever they said, oh, this guy's teaching them to, uh, to obey a different God and worship a different God and worship a different way. You need to punish him. And he goes, this has nothing to do with me. That's a Roman pagan that did that. He realized, all this church stuff, y'all need to be dealing with. Wouldn't it be glorious if judges in the world and courts would actually step up and say, this sounds like a church matter. Get out. Go talk to your pastor. Stuff in the world wouldn't be so traumatic and goofy like that. But these Jews were actually rushed out of the assembly area. The area is called the Bema. It's an open area with an 11-foot wall, concreted and bricked, and it's huge. You can actually see it. It's there today. But the proconsul would sit on top and look down on the people who were bringing the case and being judged. And at that point, the Roman soldiers came out and pushed them out and said, Get out of here. This is not my fight. Go away. It's an internal matter. But the Jews, now the Jews were embarrassed, so they felt wronged because of the Romans. Paul is actually telling the people, if you can't deal with the issue and deal with it yourself, suffer the wrongdoing. Ugh, I don't like that. Surrender my grievances visibly to the world. Suffer the wrongdoing. Just take it on the cheek. You know, this... The very first verse, a lot of people don't like, and they try to change the translation. Paul is actually telling them, I am telling you this to shame you, to embarrass you. Man, that's a rough way to go to church. Because this was the preacher at this time was Timothy, would stand up and he would say, here's a letter from Paul. Oh, yay, Paul's talking. I'm really telling you all this to shame you. Well, that's not a fun church. That's not a fun place to be. Can't we do warm fuzzies, rainbows, and butterflies? Jesus saves? Absolutely. But when there's truth that needs to be handed out, it needs to be handed out swiftly and accurately. But they should suffer this wrongdoing. So this word defraud is actually not about money. Some people like to take this text and say it's specific about money. And in other parts of the New Testament, specifically about money. We can, we can take one another to court all day long. As long as it's not about money, we need to know. That's not even in here. It's not talking about money. As a matter of fact, it's talking about your personal feelings. Oh, uh-oh. So we need to push down our feelings. And actually it says right here, we should be defrauded. We should be put to shame. But it's not talking about money. It's more like being oppressed to take something of someone else's by deception. It actually doesn't mention money at all in this text. So you can't go back and use this to say, well, we have to deal with one another on finances. Or we can go to people in the court. And No, it's not saying that at all. We are to never take one another to court as Christians. The issue is not actually named because the circumstances of the lawsuit, and hear me, the situation is not named because the circumstances of the lawsuit does not matter. We can deal with it ourselves. And we should deal with things ourselves. No matter what it is. Because it's better to suffer the loss, the shame, and embarrassment here and amongst the world than to go out and fry one another. Now hold on. I don't want to be embarrassed, Brother J.R. That I, I can't do that. But let's look at what Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 40 through 42 says this. You have heard it's, it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I like that. That's easy. I can do that. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Hurt you right back and hurt you good. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil... But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, oh, we're talking about lawsuits again, and take your tunic, see, it's not money, it's property. Let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, 
and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. We're supposed to be different. We are. It sounds terrible. Not to let specifically just let people walk on you, but for the opportunity to show them love and compassion and grace. It's better to suffer the loss. Better to suffer the embarrassment. Jesus is telling us to suffer embarrassment and take the loss. If you can't deal with the issue in a Matthew 18 way, take it on the cheek and just move on. Oh my gosh, that's, that just seems counterproductive because you said from the pulpit, don't just, don't just lay down and take it. No, no, no. It's whenever they've finally gotten to the point of taking it to a lawsuit, taking you to the courts is when I'm not going to fight. But right now, if let's just say Brother Sam does something wrong to me, I can go to him and deal with the issue. And if he decides to go to the court, that's it. I'm not going to fight it. That's the point when you don't fight. I'm not saying to lay down and take every mistreatment in the world that the world's going to offer us. Don't do that. Deal with the issues in a Christ-honoring way, no matter who it is. Can Christians take people to court? Sure, you can. That's your right. Is it better to try to work through problems in a Christ-honoring way, even though they are not a Christian? 100%. That is the best way to point them to Christ. If they're a Christian and they want to do that, again, take it on the cheek. If they do not want to listen to Scripture, if they do not want to deal with, the, deal with it in a Christian way, it's better to suffer that embarrassment than to ruin the testimony of Christians everywhere and your own. So then, here's, here's your question, and I know you're, you're wondering. So how do you surrender grievances? How do you get rid of those problems? Well, and I can give you these notes later, so I'll go through them. But figure out if the offender is a Christian or not. This is how you surrender your problems, your grievances, your issues. Find out if the person's a Christian or not. That sounds simple. Number two, know if the issue is a biblical grievance or is personal preference. If it's biblical, deal with it a biblical way. If it's personal preference, have a discussion, have a talk. Make the goal repentance and reconciliation, not victory or vengeance. And finally, take on Christ's humility and grace no matter what is going on. I know that's a lot and really quick. I don't have them on the board, but I can give you those notes later if you want them. But let's keep going with verse 8. It says this, But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brother. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor rivaler, uh, revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The final point for you this morning is this. If you have difficulty surrendering grievances, reflect on what was surrendered by Jesus. Does it not work in this meal? One more. Go ahead and click to the next one. Go ahead. One more. If you have difficulties surrendering grievances, reflect on what was surrendered by Jesus. He didn't give a little. He didn't give a portion of his life. He didn't just stay up there and get hurt. He surrendered everything. He gave up everything. And whenever I say he gave up everything, he left heaven, his throne, royal throne. Or if you look in the Old Testament and see the description of the Old Testament heaven, it was glorious and beautiful. No suffering, no hurt, no pain. And yet he said, I'm going to go help my kids. I'm going to go help my family. 
I'm going to go help my brothers and sisters. I'm going to go help my friends. And he lived 33 years of life. And in that third year just was beaten to the point of being unrecognizable as a human being. Died for you. But we have problems as Christians letting go of people hurting us. Hurting our feelings. Doing something to maybe even slander me on Facebook or saying something unkind to me in person. I've been spoken to unkindly twice this week. Individuals probably didn't realize that they were doing it. But I didn't go after them because it's not a big deal. We need to learn from Corinth before we become like Corinth and are just angry and bitter and mean to each other, wanting to sue each other, wanting to get in fights. Let us learn now to reflect on what Christ has done and what he surrendered for us. Because we were once washed and we've been sanctified and you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ. All that old stuff that Corinth has been doing. And we're going to get into it again in the rest of this chapter and for the next few chapters. Let us not be like them. Let us be as close to Christ as possible. Can I pray for you this morning?